just talk a little bit about the veterinary aspects of, of cancer because um, one in four dogs and one in six cats are going to get cancer. And so that's quite a lot of animals that we need to treat properly. So, um, and I'm, I work in Suffolk, near New Market actually. And I apologise for not being here earlier, but my daughter's prom was last night. And any of you who have 16-year-old uh, girls know exactly what that entails. I'm still recovering. So, um, it's mostly a disease in older animals, although we do see some uh, younger animals getting uh, cancer. It's the second most common cause of death in, in dogs, um, and it, uh, in, in cats, and it's the first most common cause of, of death in dogs. And we treat them just like um, we treat people with um, surgery, with um, anti-cancer drugs, with radiotherapy, um, with immunotherapy, um, which is something that's um, new and exciting in, in animals and uh, maybe something that's going to translate into treating melanoma in, in people. Um, and we do sort of modify what we do. We use a little bit lower doses um, than with people. Um, most vets don't have the facilities to um, look after animals who are septic um, and um, some of the complications of chemotherapy um, we are less prepared to, to be able to deal with as our clients so we tend to use slightly lower doses than we would do in people. The philosophy of treating cancer is to improve the quality of life if you're a retinal oncologist and to increase the length of life a little bit as a secondary consideration because dogs don't have diaries, they don't have agendas, they're not waiting for to flow to come back from America or for their kids to get married. And that means sometimes we make decisions just because we can do things doesn't mean we always should. The picture we've got here is a dog with an amelanotic melanoma. Um, not all melanomas are um, black. About a third of the ones in dogs' mouths are pink. And in this case, we could take it off and um, do a fairly radical surgical procedure to get rid of all the tumour. But this has an 80% chance of spread. And if we're not going to add anything on top of that to try and deal with that risk of spread, then you could argue that taking a large chunk of the dog's face away for maybe six months' survival isn't necessarily in that animal's interest. So we're always balancing up kind of our priorities um, as far as treating the primary versus long-term outlook versus compromising the quality of life. So to be an oncologist um, is not to be a rocket scientist, um, which is probably why I am an oncologist. You only need to know what it is, you need to know where it is, and then you need to come up with a plan. And if you look at this dog's face, you can actually um, see what we did for this particular dog. He had a tumour underneath the left-hand side of his nose, and you can see that if you look carefully because the brown bit of his nose is a bit shorter on one side than the other. And the tumour we took off by taking all of the front part of his lip off and we moved his lip on that side slightly forward. And if you look closely, you can see there's a scar running um, along his lip. And that's two years after surgery. So that's an example of what we can do. Um, so when we're looking at um, treating tumours, we're looking at um, the, um, what it is, because we need to know whether this is a tumour that spreads, so whether we've just got to worry about the disease that we can see, or if it's going to spread, then we need to think about some sort of systemic treatment on top of treating um, the tumour locally with surgery or radiation, this is just like um, human medicine. We also need to look at our individual animal, have they read the book? Just because a tumour has a low risk of spread, in this particular case, have we got spread when we see the animal? Equally, the other way around, is it a fortunate one where it's supposed to have a high risk of metastasis at presentation, in fact it doesn't. And then we look at the individual tumour type, because within a tumour type you can have an aggressive tumour, and at the other end you can have a less aggressive tumour, and we refer to this as the grade of a tumour. And then we're looking at the health status of the animal as well. Um, we're looking at you know, concurrent disease. This is a disease usually of older animals, and so, for example, if you've got a dodgy ticker, worrying about your low-grade skin tumour is probably not going to be a big issue for you because your ticker might get you before your skin tumour does. So it's those sort of um, decisions that we're going to be making. One in three people get cancer. I feel a bit stupid saying that to this audience because we all know that. Um, and that means that most people that you talk to will have an opinion on cancer and cancer treatment. And they may feel very strongly either pro-treating that animal or anti-treating that animal. And so there needs to be a long chat about their experiences, their feelings, 
what the animal situation is, and then you need to come up with the best plan for everybody. Because, um, for example, we're going to talk about amputation, which is the treatment um, currently, the gold standard treatment for osteosarcoma in dogs. That's perfectly um, straightforward if you have a relatively young, fit dog who lives on a, in a carpeted bungalow. If you live up four flights of stairs and you've got parquet flooring and another big dog who jumps all over your first dog, and maybe your first dog's got a bit of arthritis as well, then that amputation becomes a slightly different proposition. So it's really important that we have some full and frank conversations about where we're going with the treatment. The other thing we need to think about is um, what are we trying to achieve? What are the drawbacks to what we're going to offer in the way of treatment? What are the benefits from that treatment? And again, that's a full and frank discussion. And finally, are we trying to cure an animal of its cancer, or are we trying to buy some time, some good quality time? Um, I would argue what you're willing to um, do in the way of treatment or intervention is going to vary depending on what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day. Are you buying time or are you trying to cure? Um, so a little bit of biology. Um, you may not remember this because um, certainly, um, I, don't, I don't think anybody would remember this, but when you were in the uterus, um, at one point in, in your baby development, you look remarkably like a bead. So um, this is a representation of that bead. And you have a hole down the middle, and you have an outside and some squidgy stuff between the hole down the middle and the outside. And the stuff around the edge, that's going to form skin and things on the outside of you. And that's referred to as ectoderm. And then the stuff down the middle, that's the tube, that's going to form your guts and your lungs and your kidneys and things like that. And that's called um, endoderm. And both of those, when they form cancers in the future, are referred to as carcinomas. And the squidgy stuff, well, that's going to form bone and cartilage and muscle and fat and those sort of things. And that squidgy stuff is called mesenchyme. And tumours that arise from these cells are called sarcomas. So that's why osteosarcoma is called osteosarcoma. And if you look at those cells under a microscope, you can actually see some differences. So the carcinoma cells, with an eye of faith, look sort of, they clump together and they're sort of cuboidal in shape. And the round cell tumours, they're the ones like leukemias and lymphomas, they float around the place, they come from your bone marrow and they don't attach to each other. So that's the difference between those two under a microscope. One not clump and the others float free. And the sarcomas sometimes get called spindle cell tumours because they have this sort of spindeloid shape, which comes from when you used to spin uh, wool and you get that sort of sh that shape as you, your wool um, is spun into yarn. So that's kind of how the names arise from different tumours. So what about the tumours involving the bones? Well, 80% of all malignant bone tumours in the dog are osteosarcomas. And this is what a classic osteosarcoma in a dog looks like. So here it is, there's proliferation going on. And you've got some areas where the bone is being chewed away and it's becoming what's called lytic. We do see other tumours in bone. We see things like chondrosarcomas, fibrosarcomas, and some of the lymphoid neoplasms as well. We also tend to see them in certain places and associated with certain breeds. So we talk about appendicular osteosarcoma, and this is tumours of the legs, or we have what's called axial osteosarcomas, this is lip, ribs and skull. And then we have some that come up with rising mammary tissue, for example, which are called extraosseous. And they tend to arise at the growth plate in bones. Does this sound familiar? And the other thing is, unlike the people, this is dead common. Half of Irish wolf fans will have um, a, on their death certificate, for want of a better word, osteosarcoma. The other half die of heart disease. So this is also a disease very breed related. So if you have that Irish wolfhound, then you have a very high incidence of osteosarcoma. If you have a greyhound, a rottweiler, or again, any of the bigger breeds, Great Danes again I've put down there, those dogs are predisposed. So things like, um, basically from a golden retriever upwards, we see osteosarcoma and we very rarely see it in small breeds. The average age, unlike the people, is about eight years, which if you're a bigger breed dog, that's getting on a bit because Great Danes do about 12 before they, they, they succumb to old age. And then the common sites, this will ring a few bells as well, is the proximus, proximal humerus, so this is close to the shoulder in the, the long arm bone here. 
and then the distal femur, which is the end of the long thigh bone um, heading towards your knee, and then the distal radius, which is um, uh, actually this, this end here down, but near the elbow, but actually it's near the wrist joint. Slightly different from people, they do have a very high risk of spread to the lungs, and about 15% of dogs will have lung secondaries at presentation. This is a picture of a dog's chest, and what you should be able to see is these dark patches, which is air. That whole lung field should be dark, and that thing in the middle is the heart, and that is the trachea running along here. Um, and these opacities that you can see all over the chest are unfortunately secondary to a dog's primary osteosarcoma in its leg. So what else can you see on x-ray? Well, when you actually worry whether a dog's got an osteosarcoma, and the classic way of, of diagnosing this is very often because they're older dogs, people think it's arthritis, the vet, and they put it onto anti-inflammatories, and that works for a bit, and then the anti-inflammatories stop working. Or the other way that sometimes it's diagnosed is the dog trips over a matchstick and breaks its leg, which is obviously not a normal thing to do. Um, and then you can be thinking about a bone tumor. So people x-ray them at that point. And we can see, like we said on this pre, I've shown this x-ray before, this is the proximal humerus. We can see these areas of bony proliferation and areas of bone destruction. And like I say, sometimes you get these pathological fractures where the dog trips over something and fractures it. Sometimes you have a soft tissue swelling, but sometimes you can't feel that very well. And on x-ray, it's quite difficult to sometimes to say, oh, it's an osteosarcoma. It could be any other primary bone tumour. And sometimes, if you're in the USA, it could be a fungal infection. So, the gold standard of diagnosis is a biopsy, but sometimes that can be quite hard to do because um, you may not hit the actual active bit of tumour. You might hit some of the bone around it. You might get inflammation as a diagnosis. Um, sometimes you can do it really cleverly by um, sticking an ultrasound um, probe over a very a uh, lytic, very destructive piece of, of tumour, um, and then stick a needle in and suck some cells out, and that can sometimes give you an answer. But sometimes you have to use more invasive ways to get, get a, a diagnosis. And the treatment options are amputation at the moment, and using anti-cancer drugs afterwards to mop up this high risk of spread elsewhere. The way we view amputation is that it removes the primary and provides instant pain relief because these are usually quite painful lesions. I'm sure I don't need to tell people in the audience that. And then we start the cytotoxic drugs once that's happened. This dog is 24 hours after surgery, um, and if you count, you'll see his post application is missing from there. We have looked um, at limb sparing surgery, and this dog is not an osteosarcoma patient. Um, this is one of no. Fitzpatrick, the bionic vet's um, um, dogs. Um, this dog had a, a, a prosthesis uh, for a different reason. The problem we have, um, which is interesting, is about half of dogs when we try and do a limb sparing surgery um, getting post-operative infection, um, which bizarrely um, increases their risk of survival. Um, they do much better, and it seems to be a sort of general jigging up of the immune system. And people have done some work looking at chipping up the immune system and without using um, nasty um, infectious bugs, um, but um, certainly um, that's been reported. And because this rate of complication is high, and animals have to be hospitalised when they do get osteomyelitis this in infection in their bones, um, we still go for amputation as our kind of first line of attack. Um, we tend to try and treat ours about 10 days post-operatively um, because that's usually when the pathologist has come back and confirmed a diagnosis of osteosarcoma. Um, but there's no data to show exactly when we should be using chemotherapy for these dogs. Um, you notice that um, we, we, we take a lot of pictures of our three-legged um, heavier dogs. Um, every picture you'll see is going to be a big heavy dog. Um, and that's because clients are very resistant to taking a leg off, which I can totally understand. Um, but particularly, you know, this dog's about sort of 55, 60 kilos, and people wonder how they're going to do. There's two things that tell you how they're going to do. The first is that some of these dogs come, and come in on three legs anyway, because the leg is so painful, they're not using it. So if you see them on three legs right from the word go, you know they're going to do fine. 
Equally, they seem to be quite painful, but they're trying very hard to use that fourth leg that's got the disease in. They've probably got other issues with the other legs, and you need to look quite closely at those legs to make sure that they don't have a you know, good reason why they're not going to do on, on, on three. So for side effects wise, when we're talking about chemotherapy, most animals have no side effects. So um, quite interesting that. And most animals, um, it makes them feel a lot better actually, like coming to see me. And we know this because we've had a couple get loose in the car park from their owners slip their leads and they come back in. Um, and I suspect some of this is to do with the fact that we do give them bone meows after chemo. <laughs> So um, what we tend to think about is um, the side effects that again are reported for people which are to do with high multiplying cells, normal high, uh, high multiplying cells in the body. So these where remember these are this bag. So these are obviously bone marrow which are your white cells that people keep measuring in your blood and a lesser degree of red cells in your platelets. Um, hair loss, um, humans have continuously growing hair. Most breeds of dog don't. Um, if you have a Labrador, you'll know they molt twice a year because the hoover bag spends its time covering, covering black hairs or, or, or red or, or yellow ones. Um, but the terrier breeds, particularly, who have to be stripped um, rather than having a, a molting type behaviour, they do look a bit moth eaten. And so um, this is a Westie, and you can see he's losing his hair around his, his head, and that's quite common. I think it's as they rustle around in the leaves and you know, use, eat out of their, their food bowls, they actually traumatise the hair slightly and it falls out. Gastrointestinal signs, so vomiting and diarrhoea, yes we do see those but they're relatively uncommon and they're usually self-limiting. Um, most animals um, we send home with anti-sickness drugs and if they go off their food then the first thing clients are told is to put them on the anti-sickness drugs because that usually stops them from feeling nauseous. So what drugs do we use? Well, we use monotherapy for this. Um, so for osteosarcoma, originally cisplatin was the drug that was used and then we moved on to using carboplatin most commonly because it's better tolerated and the efficacy is about the same. Um, people have used doxorubicin um, and again, the, the, the effect is, is roughly the same, but there are some other side effects of doxorubicin that we um, try and avoid um, using that drug. People have tried alternating carboplatin and doxorubicin um, because that's one, um, that's a pattern of drug, and this drug here is an anthracycline. And if you use different drugs, the idea is different groups of drugs, that you get a better cell kill. Um, but we haven't seen any real advantages in doing that. So at the moment, everybody gives them carboplatin. Pain relief is absolutely mandatory if they're still attached to their tumour. You know, bone pain is pretty foul, and so we use what are called non steroidal anti inflammatories, um, which are um, drugs that you will, you will know about using for um, arthritis and things like that in dogs and in people. And we usually add in paracetamol and codeine on top of that. You can't use paracetamol in cats, um, and uh, tramadol as well, which is no good. And um, interesting is technical this bit. Um, non steroidals um, are usually what's called COX-2 inhibitors, which is a, an enzyme that you see. Um, and in 77% of canine osteosarcomas, uh, COX-2 was upregulated, so there's more of it around the place. And the more intense um, the state, the more COX-2 around the place, the shorter the survival time for these dogs. You were talking a bit about um, this phosphonase um, in the research sample this morning. And we have actually done a little bit of work on this phosphonates in dogs. Um, the idea here um, <coughs> is um, you can use them in two ways. Um, this phosphonates we use for little old ladies with um, um, osteoporosis. And the idea is that they stop um, the bone releasing its calcium in, into the bloodstream and thereby weakening the bones in, in old ladies. And in the same with the cancer, it stops um, bone naturally releasing um, calcium and weakening bones. And the two ways you can use it are, one is to deal with pain because bone destruction leads to pain. And the second way you can use it is to decrease the risk of fracture. And certainly um, from the pain point of view, initially there's very good reviews saying that giving these um, drugs 
did improve pain control, but they did a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which is basically means that neither the vet nor the owner of the dog knows what the dog's receiving, and looked at the pain scores, and the results weren't less good. And we've also used radiotherapy sometimes um, for lesions um, that we can't, when we have a dog we can't amputate, um, to um, make the animal more comfortable. Um, but you have to be careful because if you make them so comfortable with a very damaged um, bone, they may put extra weight on that bone and fracture the bone. So you have to choose your lesions carefully such that the, that the bone is still capable of bearing weight. In cats, it's quite interesting, it's a different disease. It's quite common in cats, um, but it doesn't spread um, if it's a leg one. The skull ones tend to have a poorer prognosis because um, simply taking away the chunks of cat head is quite technically demanding and not surprisingly most cats don't tolerate it particularly well. Yeah, it's all very interesting this, but what's this really got to do with people? That's why we're here today, isn't it? We're talking about people. Well, the first thing is that just like the human genome, the canine genome has been completely sorted out now and we can even do things like say, oh, there's a gene on chromosome 1 in a person in a certain position. Where's that on the dog? And you'll find that it's probably on chromosome 17 or something like that because we can map one to the other. So we can at any point, any gene that you choose a gene, any gene, tell us where it is in the human chromosome, we'll tell you where it is in the dog chromosome. So we can do that. The other thing is that when you look at them, we're about 85% similar, which is quite amazing, really. And particularly when it comes to basic functions to do with cell regulation and how cells cycle and basic housekeeping stuff that cells do. Um, and not surprisingly, because we're mammals, they're pretty much the same. We also share a similar environment. And osteosarcoma is a naturally occurring cancer. It's not being made in a lab. And so canine osteosarcoma um, is a better model when it, we look at human osteosarcoma because the immune system's intact, we haven't fiddled with it, um, and um, it just makes it a, 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 a good candidate for looking at something. Animals live and die quicker, so if we're looking for an outcome, we talk about one year survivals when human people, medics, talk about five year survivals. So we're going to know if something's looking like it's promising quicker. We're closer to dogs than we are to mice. And then the really cool thing is dog breeds. When you're looking for maybe a genetic susceptibility to a cancer, if you're looking at people and you take 100 people with the cancer and 100 people without the cancer, then people look different. You have black people and you have white people and you have tall people and you have short people and you have people with blonde hair and people with blue eyes. And all of that you have to kind of wade through to get to the nitty gritty of what makes people with cancer different from people without cancer. You take a hot 100 boxer dogs with brain tumour and 100 boxer dogs without a brain tumour, then a boxer dog, to a large degree, is a boxer dog, is a boxer dog. So all those genes that you might have had difficulty wading through with people, they've been controlled for. And so the difference between the boxer dog with a brain tumour and the boxer dog without the brain tumour is very likely to be something to do with the cancer. And so from the point of view of, of looking at those genes, it, it doesn't get rid of all the extra genes you might not want to look at, but it does actually get down to, um, as opposed to the needle in the haystack, perhaps the needle in the bucket full of hay rather than the haystack. So dog breeds are very useful. This is a, a scientific paper that was published in 2009. That's why it says 2009 in big letters up there. And what they did is they looked at dog bone um, tumour tissue and children um, bone tumour tissue. And they took normal people tissue and normal dog tissue. And then they looked at the genetic profile um, of those four different groups. And what they found was that the dog osteosarcoma tissue had the same genetic abnormalities, was closer in, in relationship to um, the genes expressed by the humans with osteosarcoma, and that the human normal and the human and the dog normal were actually completely separate. So the canine normal is clustering over here, the human normal is clustering here, and then the human osteosarcomas are these red ones, and you can see they're interspersed 
uh, related to the canine osteosarcoma ones, which were marked in blue. So that's very interesting in itself. We also found out, looking at that, that um, because we know dog osteosarcoma is a little bit more aggressive than human osteosarcoma, they looked at the genes that were slightly different between the two groups as a big as two big groups, the human osteosarcoma ones and the dog osteosarcoma ones, and they found a few genes in the dogs that were more often different than um, they were in the humans, if you looked in one big group. And when they looked at those genes in humans who had a bad outcome, they found that they were expressed in those individual humans. So you can use the dog data to look at the human data, so you can mine one for information that might help you with the other. Kind of complicated that, but if you think about it, hopefully it work out. So what else have we done in dogs that might help people? Well, the limb sparing work um, was done originally um, in dogs, and we've tried all sorts of weird and wonderful things um, using radiation, for example, where um, they've taken out the bone, they've irradiated it, and then put it back in again once the tumor cells have been killed. Um, we've also looked at, um, I think this is the stuff you were talking about this morning, I can never pronounce it, but infertinide. That was originally, that work was done in dogs before it moved on into people. And at the moment, we're looking at an mTOR inhibitor, this is another genetic thing that goes wrong, uh, called rapamycin that's being used in dogs to look at survival data for dogs to see if that improves their survival with the hope that that will move on again to people. There are a few things to appreciate. The first is that um, we're talking about not an animal model, we're talking about a person's pet. Um, so they're not an experimental animal. We do have some regulations in veterinary medicine that means we have to use drugs under what's called the cascade system. Most of the cancers fall out of this because most of the drugs we use aren't licensed to use in cats and dogs, they're used licensed for people. But we don't have mice to worry about, which does help when it comes to um, moving on with trials and things like that. So what we're really after is a win-win, something that benefits the animal but also benefits people at the same time, and that's quite achievable. So where do I think comparative oncology can go? Well, we can help in other tumor types as well as osteosarcoma, but the major thing I think about osteosarcoma in dogs that may be an advantage to the human situation is it's dead common. So if you want to look at um, potential interventions, it's much quicker to recruit a cohort of dogs for a clinical trial than it is for people. And because the outcome is quicker, then again, you're more likely to get your information about yeah, this is a very promising path or not. It doesn't mean that you, you know, that automatically if it works in a dog, it can work in a person, but it is going to help you, hopefully, say, well, this one's definitely worth following on. Equally, if it turns out to be some unexplained toxicities, um, or things that you haven't thought about, then not great from my point of view, but from your point of view, you know, that's something to know about before you move on to a human trial. We can also look very unpainfully in both species, because we can take cheek swabs from our dogs, so no, not even a needle involved, um, to look at the genes that may give an increase of risk of cancer, or alternatively might be important in, in targeting for, for therapy because sometimes if we understand how the cancer arises in the first place and what genetically has gone wrong, then we can actually sort that out either by looking at um, targeted therapy like small molecule inhibitors and, and things like that. So truly we can end up in a win-win situation. Um, and um, we actually quite a lot of us at the Animal Health Trust. There's 240 people work at the Animal Health Trust, not, not all on cancer. Um, we do other work as well. Um, this is just um, a couple of my um, colleagues, or a few of my colleagues who, who work with me at the Trust. And that's it. <laughs>